approaching platform 11 as it lines Cosmo from Monte King's Cross. There are very few things that will get the station master at Waverley out of his bowler hat, but the Flying Scotsman is one of them. The famous express that leaves London when he's barely finished breakfast and gets to Edinburgh not long after his lunchtime. There are other trains which get here just as fast, but when I'm on the one called the Flying Scotsman, I feel I've actually got here quicker. Which is one of the reasons, of course, that hard-headed railway companies give their trains romantic names. But to many people, the name Flying Scotsman means something quite different. A famous locomotive which was born in 1923 and has been to many other places beside Edinburgh. Up and down North America for a start. Is the Flying Scotsman a train or is it an engine or is it a white elephant? It's one of the most famous names in the world, but where did the name come from? To find all this out, we have to go back even before railways were invented. Up to about 1850, if you'd wanted to get to Scotland in a hurry, you'd probably have gone by flying coach. It flew up the Great North Road at an average speed of about 10 miles an hour, stopping every 10 miles or so just to change horses. Apart from that, it went non-stop, hence flying, through the day and the night, taking nearly 48 hours to do the 400 miles from London to Edinburgh. It wasn't much fun at the best of times, and it was worst if you had an outside seat on top where you had to keep awake the whole time. That's where we get the expression, dropping off to sleep. Then came the railway, and the average speed of the journey to Edinburgh magically quadrupled. The through route was opened by 1850. In 1852, King's Cross Station in London was completed, and in 1862, the first named express appeared, the Scotch Express, which is what they first called the Flying Scotsman. It left King's Cross Station every morning at 10 a.m. on the dot and started to fly north. The speed may have been a lot better, but the facilities were the same as on a stagecoach. No toilets, no food, no moving from your seat, so they must have been longing to get to that 20-minute stop at York for lunch and everything else. As the passengers piled into the restaurant at 2.35, the soup was put in front of them. And from then on, the restaurant resounded with the crash of crockery and courses being rushed to and fro. Outside, the passengers could hear the shunting and crashing of the new engine being put on. But the sound they were really listening for was the station bell. Once you heard that, you left your apple pie where it was and rushed back to the train. It was the Victorian equivalent, almost, of making a hasty plane change at Heathrow. In fact, after York, they were leaving Great Northern Territory and flying up the northeastern line. The new engine, full of coal and water again, pulled them over the high-level bridge into Newcastle, where they had another chance to resort to the lavatories at 4.55, then, with hardly a pause, on, on, up to Berwick, and another change of engines, this time to a North British machine. They finally arrived at Edinburgh, 8.35, ten and a half hours after leaving London. It may seem slow to us, but to them it was a miracle. A miracle only to the well-heeled, of course, for it wasn't until 1887 that third-class passengers were catered for at all. After that, things rapidly improved for everyone. Restaurant cars were introduced, which meant, of course, that corridors had to be introduced as well. The first lavatories appeared on trains, and as early as 1875, the North British Railway had pioneered sleeper compartments. All this meant the trains were getting heavier, and that meant that engines had to get more and more powerful. Then, suddenly, the Scotch Express hit the headlines in 1888. It got caught up in a series of races to the north against rival companies, and the record time to Scotland was lowered suddenly from nine hours to seven and a half hours. The race became part of British railway history, shortly to be followed by another now familiar sight in British stations, the railway enthusiast. Well, I've been on here at three o'clock in the morning. Was it here that they always changed engines? Oh, yes, always, yes. They always did that? Yes, they changed engines 
here and Grant from Newcastle. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Although yeah. it, was, it was one company taking off oh, the yes. engine, yeah. another company putting well, on. Well, no, the men here. I met Arthur Dewar in York Station in 1985. He had first been here to watch trains Stand as a boy here. in 1916. So it must have been quite a sight, York Station, in those Oh, days. yes, it was marvellous. Yeah, it was beautiful. Gleaming green engines, you know, brass. Not, not dirty and smoke No, and brass columns and brass round the wheels, all shining. I'm afraid yeah. well, we have to go to the museum to see yeah. them nowadays, don't oh, we? Oh, yes, <laughs> yes. You see how that's how they were. Yes. Yeah, all like that. Yeah. So you yeah. must have seen the Flying Scotsman come through many a time. Well, it wasn't called that then, <clears throat> until about 1938. It was known to the railway people as the Special Scotch Express. But in the, in the timetable, it wasn't differentiated from any other train. But it was already known as... Well, as most people knew it by, yes, yes. In 1923, Flying Scotsman, the engine was born. One of a new class, the A1 Pacifics, which could run non-stop from London to Edinburgh and also had rather glamorous film star looks. Just as well as they were about to become film stars, as I discovered from railway film collector John Huntley. John, this must be about the first film of the non-stop Flying Scotsman exists. Yes, it is. It's a bit of a mystery film. We don't really know who made it, but it is a most valuable record of the old London North Eastern Railway. And, of course, certainly there's no doubt about the film was made to celebrate this idea that started on the 1st of May, 1928, when they began the non-stop run, even including things like a, a cocktail bar on the train. You know, this train was extraordinary, really. It had, at different times, it had a cinema, in-flight movies, sort of... Fly Scotsman style in the 30s. It had a hairdressing salon on the train at one time for women originally. It was so successful that they introduced it for men. And in the early 1930s, it was a kind of sort of disco where they had an old horn radio which piped in dance music and people danced as you went on your way to Scotland. So it was quite a train, the Flying Scotsman in those days. It was a a pretty magical thing, you know, in 1928. You think how long ago that actually is to run a train all this distance. Okay. Well, uh, <clears throat> there seems to be more than a whiff of advertising about this. It's a feeling that uh, it's not just a documentary of saying, come travel with us. You know? That probably was the price of all facilities and a free <laughs> ticket on the train, I suspect, <laughs> yes, in those days. That's, yeah. how, that's how corruption works. Yeah. <laughs> how long did the train take in those days? How long was it, Frank? Then it was all slowed up, wasn't it, because of the stupid business of... Because of uh, the agreement, term, yeah. uh, it didn't have to arrive uh, in Edinburgh before the uh, Midland train arrived in Glasgow. Frank Mays, our other expert, was actually a fireman on The Flying Scotsman in its heyday, though this was the first time he'd seen any of these films. So they, they, they purposely slowed it down? Oh, they did, yes, and they kept it outside of Edinburgh for a little while until the uh, time approached and it was allowed in. And a lovely name you noticed then, that's a grand name. Oh. I think it's because they're both full of unfinished buildings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> those trams, I always associate those with the early days of the Edinburgh Festival. And very much, Princess Street never was quite the same without the trams. There they are. Yeah, for my day. Before the 1920s were out, the engine itself had become an established film star. Not in a documentary or a commercial, but in a fully-fledged thriller. This looks a very different sort of film. I detect a story here. Yes, this was 1929. Most of the textbooks say that Alfred Hitchcock's film, Blackmail, is the first sound film, but I don't think it's right. This is the first one. It was directed by Carlton Knight, and as you'll see, it's mainly shot as a silent film. It uses mainly silent shots. That's uh, Pauline Johnson, the heroine of the film, and this they did for real. They were allowed to shoot using 4472 Flying Scotsman, and she really did this. I mean, they're certainly not going less than 40, 45 miles an hour in relatively high-heeled 1920s <laughs> shoes, <laughs> battling her way forward to the loco and in pursuit, in fact, of the villain. Now, the fireman of the film is Ray Milan. It was his first movie. And the storyline is that he's a young fireman, and this is his girlfriend, but in fact, although he doesn't know it, the engine driver is her father. <laughs> I'll see you in the parlour. The near thing last night, an old man came on, really caught me. Just managed to dodge him with a skin of my teeth. <laughs> 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 
silent acting. Why? So you're the man. <laughs> Never fight <laughs> on the football bench. But you see, what's incredible about this film is that, I mean, that's the sort of thing you normally shoot at the studio. Oh, here she goes now. She's got to cross over from the loco to the tender. How much to hold on to? Oh, and no, 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 she finds, you see, the rhythm of the two is totally different. And even that's for real. I mean, it's the sort of thing you've always done in the studio today, set it up. She's in pursuit of the villain, what's played it? by Alec Hurley. What's his interest in uh, the villain? Oh, he's out to get the engine driver who uh, ratted on him and lost him his job. Oh. <laughs> Ray Milan. Uh, go. You see, even that shot for real, it's extraordinary the way they're setting up. <laughs> the story is a little on the melodramatic side. And so she sees her old dad knocked for six by the villain. Now, here's a rather interesting bit because the villain makes sure that the loco is running and he goes back using the passageway and the tender. There it is, yeah. uh, which was how you got from the footplate of the locomotive back into the train itself. It's through this little narrow passageway running through the tender with the water tank on, on the coal and everything. And there's Alec Hurley doing some little grimaces. This is the bit that Sir Nigel Gresley hated. He puts his hand out, pulls a little plug, and the loco separates out from the stock, and they both go on racing away. And then Sir Nigel Gresley said very indignantly afterwards, when I saw this wretched film, he said, they suggested that the London North Eastern Railway had not yet discovered the vacuum brake. <laughs> well, the film had a happy ending for everyone, except the villain. Ray Milland went on to become a Hollywood star on the strength of it, and Sir Nigel Gresley never let any filming take place on the LNER again. In fact, it wasn't until after his death and well after the war that our third film was made. Uh, this Elizabethan Express was really the last great flowering of steam. You see, with these marvellous Gresley A4 locomotives. And really, I think what they decided was that as they knew that steam's days were numbered by now, they thought they'd have this run non-stop from King's Cross to Edinburgh, as it had been done in the old days. Now, they didn't actually strangely do it with the 10 a.m. Flying Scotsman. They did it as a summer service only at 9.30, and this ran in front of the Flying Scotsman, but the idea was to keep alive this tradition of non-stop running with steam. It's very much of the 50s, the whole thing. It has a funny old uh, commentary. The passengers sitting at buffet tables, the Howards, the Burts, the Cynthias, the Mabels, enjoying the comfort and ease in their seats, careless of crumbs in turnips or pleats, admire the gleam on the chromium plate, the polish on tables, the unfaded state of curtains and fabrics, but rarely give thought to the long years of training. Now beyond York, the Scots crew prepare to relieve the strain on the English pair. Well, they had a reserve compartment, and they, the Edinburgh men, they worked from Edinburgh to York the day previous, stayed overnight in London, in a hostel, and then they signed on duty in the morning at King's Cross, rode passenger in the train in a reserve compartment, had a meal on the train before they actually re relieved, and then went through the corridor tender, which we can see now, onto the footplate, and relieved while the train was going at 50 or 60 mile an hour. And there you see Tony McLeod, the A market driver, relieving Bob Marable. Bob Marable's taking his case and walking back and through. And there's Mungo Scott. Goes looking at the fire to see the state of the fire before he starts firing up. Sir Nigel Gresley designed his A4 with the speed of a greyhound, the strength of a boar. But when he put fire in her stomach, he taught her to burn with a furious thirst for water. So when she approaches a water trough, watch Farmer Mungo doing his stuff. There's the water troughs. He's dropping the scoop in. There you can see the water overflowing, and I should imagine they'll get somewhere in the region of about 4,000 gallon if they're lucky. But these, these guys are the kings of the track. Oh, oh, yes, they're top link men, and probably Tony McLeod there, he's worked on the railway, say, 40 years before he started doing this type of work. So they're all quite old, then? 
well, the drivers? Um, on those jobs, yes. Uh, Tony McLeod would be 60, 61. Uh, and he'd been on those jobs for five or six years when that film was taken. And Mungo Scott was in his middle 20s. As they come down from Grant's house, the peak of the climb, they're over the worst. And she's running on time. Oh, there was great rivalry between the different crews, and uh, you would swear by your driver. The consumption worked out at about a tonne per 60 mile. So you actually physically lifted on a little shovel seven oh, yes, tons of snow. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Arnott of Waverley Station has a very high sense of occasion. If a train's a non-stopper, his topper is proper. His Homburg's for trains of low station. When that film was made, you can feel they thought nothing could change. Steam engines would go on forever, Britain would always have an empire, and Blackpool and Newcastle United would always be in the cup final. But overnight, almost, British Rail's modernisation programme announced the end of steam. Four years later, the first Deltic diesels were being ordered for the Edinburgh run. And soon after that, steam engines were being replaced, not by steam engines, but by other kind of engines, for the first time in history. The steam loco really was becoming a threatened species. Now, British Rail were going to look after the future, but who was going to look after the past? In the nick of time, a new breed of man arrived, the private collector. Forty years old, only done three million miles. What a sniff at three thousand pounds. That's what a businessman paid for this grand veteran of the Iron Road. All dressed up for the part, the proud man from Nottinghamshire, Alan Fegler, was with the engine he saved from the breakup yard. The flying Scotsman has years of work in her still, but progress in the shape of diesel locomotives has pushed her aside. That's a sad thought for everybody who's ever thrilled at the sight of an express steam engine. Alan Pegler was realising the dream that most men only play with in their attic, running a real life-size train set. In 1968, 40 years on, he recreated the first non-stop run to Edinburgh. There is, in fact, no real advantage in going from London to Edinburgh non-stop, and British Rail don't bother to do it even today. And when you have to take two tenders to carry all that coal and water, there are disadvantages. But when you're on your very own engine, you don't think about things like that, you just do it. Today, Edinburgh, tomorrow the world, and the next year, Alan Pegler took the engine to America. The Flying Scotsman was trying to make money out of hauling a business exhibition train across America. The man who ended up in charge of the operation was George Hinchcliffe. Well, after the first trip, which from the exhibitor's point of view was very successful, from Boston to Houston, Texas, the train was put into store, and eventually the following year, 1970, we took it out of store in Slayton, Texas, uh, and worked it right up to Green Bay. Now, that was fairly successful, and I was in charge of the operation then, and we were actually making money hand over fist. The great thing in 1970 was that we visited very small places where we were a very big event in a comparatively small town. 20,000 inhabitants, and probably a third of them would turn out. It was marvellous. <laughs> But the expense of running an engine so far from home turned into difficulties, and the difficulties turned into enormous debts until another rescuer was needed desperately. 
he turned up in the nick of time in the shape of one of the McAlpine family. <laughs> well, uh, Bill rang me one night and said, uh, I've heard terrible things about uh, Flying Scotsman. Could you go over to America and find out what's happened? The day I actually uh, saw the lawyer who was responsible for Flying Scotsman while it was in America was the day that the girl typist in San Francisco was about to type the writ uh, to impound the locomotive. But uh, with a time factor of about four hours between Washington time and San Francisco time, I had a chance to phone Bill McAlpine and say, look, uh, if you can pay so many thousand dollars, um, the engine's yours. And so, on what might nearly have been a funeral barge, Flying Scotsman set off home again. They say that all the cells in the human body are replaced every seven years, and something of the same sort happens to a steam engine. There isn't much here that dates back to 1923, but the spirit lives on, and as much as anything, that's what they're restoring today at Steamtown, here at Carnforth in Lancashire. The work is done by a mixture of dedicated volunteers and permanently employed specialists. Welding new tubes for the superheater is definitely specialist work, but it takes more than expertise to get a hundred tons of metal steaming again. It takes a lot of devotion, a lot of money, and back-aching hard work. Well, we try to do bits and pieces of what we can. We're not all skilled. You know? I used to be a BR fireman on this type of engine at Doncaster, and that's where my interest stems from. So I think you. Once you've been on that job, there's something bred into you that uh, it never leaves you, you know. It's inside you, it's all they're always there. I'm at work here five days a week for pay, and then the other two I'm usually down there doing the volunteers' work as well. That's how I reason we started. It's all right knowing it by the textbook, but it's, you know, when you get your hands dirty, you know, the way it works and how it performs. We do it for the love of it, and um, not only that, we're preser preserving part of the railway heritage of the country, and, um, okay. I mean, you can go to a five-year-old child and they've heard of the Flying Scotsman. This uh, crown looks in poor condition, Pat. Right. So the white metal has moved slightly. Dirt and grit gets into the white metal, and it gets so much dirt into it, it won't absorb oil like, and it's, eventually it'll start to wear them like. It's just like your car began, exactly. White metal, well, it's 65% tin, and the rest is lead like and antimony. It's quite expensive. It's me a day to re metal one like a full day. Mm. And then probably another day to machine it and fit it on. Well, I first started in 1942, straight from school at 14. At one time, if you lived in campus and you were in the railway family, you automatically went onto the railway line. And so Flying Scotsman is ready for the road again. Well, Almost ready. Before it can go out on British Rail track, there have to be last minute checks and an intimate inspection by British Rail's surgeons and specialists. A match fitness test on all those hamstrings and cartilages. After that, a proper road test, a 30 mile run up to the Yorkshire Dales and back. And that's how I came to have the magic chance to go down the same tender corridor along which Alec Hurley as the villain went in 1929 and through which so many drivers and farmers passed on that non-stop run. At the end of the tunnel, I found British Rail Inspector Reg Lawrence. All right, if I come... Yeah, come on, do what you want, yeah. It'd be quite, it would be quite safe. Uh, think the... Think about now, it's very safe. Above that, well, 
got to think of the age of them. They are, after all, this one is actually as old as me. It was built the year I was born. Really? Yeah, 1923, yeah. Somebody was telling us, is this really your last day? Definitely, yeah. I retire on Friday, but I've got uh, two little parties tomorrow and the day after. So your, your last job is actually testing the flying costume? My last job is flying, yes. That's a good way to go out. It is indeed. Well, come in with a full response. Where are we all You wouldn't dare fail her today. You wouldn't like to fail her today, then. Oh, no, no way, no. No, she's in good order now. She made a good job. So, what's it like riding on the footplate of the Flying Scotsman? Well, it shakes around a lot, like a bucking horse. It's dirty, and you can hardly hear yourself speak, and things blow into your eyes. Your legs get hot from the firebox, and your top half freezes in the 60 mile an hour draft. In other words, it's fantastic. I'm not surprised that people want to give up their weekends and their holidays and their fortunes to keep an engine like this going. It would never get a train from London to Edinburgh in today's four and a half hours, but when you see it charging through the English countryside, you just forget that any other kind of engine has ever existed. You also forget that for the last 20 years, the Flying Scotsman has been living on borrowed time. And it may be that one day, the only relic we'll have of engines like that is films like this. But then again, the fast diesels which now do the Flying Scotsman run are also living on borrowed time, as electrification marches up the East Coast. Now, diesels have their own devoted fans, and one day, perhaps, history will repeat itself, and steam nostalgia films will be replaced by diesel nostalgia films. But until then, what a way to go.